Those of you that uh, remember me from previous years may begin to get the impression that I like speaking about gloomy topics. Once again, the topic of my talk tonight is going to be the period of time we find ourselves in, this period of mourning, and the climax of this period, which is Tisha B'Av. It's not a very happy subject. And it seems that every year I speak about the same thing. And it's only because the calendar works out as such, that whenever Rabbi Mintz goes away, then it's for three weeks. And uh, I like to speak about timely topics. So that's going to be the topic of tonight's discussion, trying to get maybe another, a new insight into the meaning of Tisha B'Av and how it relates to us. In the secular world, I don't think any attention is given to when specific events occur. Maybe there are some superstitious people, but people that are not superstitious don't give any significance, any credibility to the time in which specific events occur. Let's take an example. In this country, one of the many days that are observed are the, the days that commemorate the birthdays of two of the greatest of the American presidents, George Washington's birthday and Abraham Lincoln's birthday. I don't know. Maybe everyone here does know when Washington's birthday is and when Lincoln's is. But if you ask, you ask the kids, no one will be able to tell you. Why? Because when we were growing up, there were two separate days. Lincoln's birthday was February 12th, and Washington was on February 22nd. The fact that they're both in February, is there any significance to that? I don't think anyone attributes any significance. The fact that it worked out like that? Statistically, well, it's 1 in 12. Not exactly 1 in 12, because February is a short month. There's only 28 days. The others are 31. But it's almost 1 in 12. That's not so, that's not, those odds aren't so, uh, so tremendous that it shouldn't have worked out like that. But the fact that it was in February has no real significance. It could have been any time. And that's why, since it has no significance, that's why they were able to take those two days and combine them and selfishly so, instead of commemorating their birthdays, we have another holiday. We have a President's Weekend. We turned it into a holiday weekend, and now we can enjoy another holiday weekend. In Judaism, we would never do such a thing. Time has tremendous significance, and the day on which something occurs has tremendous meaning. And we pay careful attention not only to the month in which something occurs, but also to the day, and sometimes even to the hour in which events occur. The Talmud tells us that a person's personality is affected by the day of the week in which he's born, and even in the hour of the day in which he's born. That's not the, I'm not going to elaborate on that right now, but there is tremendous significance in time. When a person is born and when different events occur, have tremendous meaning. They cast light upon, to the, upon the event. They cast light upon the personality. We'll be able to understand the personality if we know when the person was born and when every event occurred. Let's take the significance of different months. We'll start with the first month. Even though Rosh Hashanah is on the first of Tishrei, but as far as the order of month are concerned, we consider Nisan, the month in which Pesach occurs, as being the first month. If we look at the word Nisan, right away we'll see in there a word, the word Nes. What does Nes mean? Nes is a miracle. And that's what the month of Nisan is all about. It's a month of the greatest miracles. The first great miracle that we as a nation experienced was the, the miracle that we commemorate on the Shabbos before Pesach. It's called the Shabbos that's called Shabbos HaGodl. 
what great miracle occurred? We all know that the Jewish people lived in Egypt at the time, and the Egyptians worshipped sheep. That was their deity, the sheep. And an Egyptian idolized the sheep, and they were very careful to treat it with the greatest respect, and they worshipped the sheep. Imagine an entire nation is commanded to take sheep into their homes with the intention of slaughtering the, sl the sheep. Do you know what kind of riots that should have, should have, should have brought about? Do you know what kind of, how, how they should have been a, a, a pogrom? pogrom should, they should have, the Egyptians should have gone and, take, and, and, and killed on every Jew. They hear they are, they see Jews. They're taking, each one's taking a sheep, taking it into his home, tying it to his bedpost, and that, what are you doing over here? This is my God. What you take him? Oh, I'm going to slaughter in four days from now. I'm going to be slaughtering this sheep as a sacrifice to my God. And nothing happened. The Egyptians quiet. They didn't say. They didn't. They, they didn't no one made a peep. That was a, that was the first miracle. Then came the night of Pesach. The the the, the, the plague of the firstborn. All firstborn Egyptians died. No firstborn Jews. Throughout the country, all firstborns. Tremendous miracle. Then the Jews were allowed to leave Egypt. That itself was a miracle. No one was ever allowed to Egypt. The, sl the slave never escaped from Egypt. And all of a sudden, 600,000 men plus women and children, over 3 million people are leaving. <laughs> Seven days later, the splitting of the Red Sea. <laughs> That's an unbelievable supernatural miracle. So we understand very well why this month would be called Nisan. We hear this is a month where, which is prone for Nisan, for miracles. And what I want to do now, what I want to do now is try and understand what's the significance of the month in which Tisha B'Av occurs, the month which is the fifth month in the Jewish calendar, the month that's called Av. We know that not only does the time in which an event occurs tell us something about the event, but also the time in which it occurs as in relation to where it's to, to where it comes out as far as the reading of the Torah is concerned. We have a Torah, five books of Moses, that are divided up into 53 portions. And those 53 portions are read throughout the year. Every single year, we go through the entire 53 portions. Really, there are only, on a regular year, there are only 50 Shabbos, so sometimes we read two. And we know that by looking into the portion of the week, many times we can see how different events that occur and even now are alluded to in the weekly portion. From the beginning of Sefer Shmos, the, 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 the five books of Moses are divided into five books. From the beginning of Sefer Shmos, Pasha Shmos, until the end of the Torah, there is not one parsha in which the name of Moshe Rabbeinu, in which Moses' name does not appear. It's understandably so. From the time of his birth in Pasha Shmos, Moshe Rabbeinu, he's the leader of the Jewish people. He's the one that takes them out of Egypt. He's the one that gives them the Torah. Of course, he is the central figure. The Torah is called Torah's Moshe. But there's one exception. There's one parsha in which Moshe Rabbeinu's name does not appear. And that's in Parshas Tetzave. And the Vilna Gaon made an unbelievable observation. When did Moshe Rabbeinu die? What's the day of his yard site? The seventh of Adar. The seventh of Adar. If you look in the Jewish calendar, you'll find that almost without exception, the week in which Zion Adar falls out is the week in which we read the Pasha of Tetzaveh. And the Torah was hinting to us that this is the week in which Moshe Rabbeinu, so to speak, disappeared from this world. 
all of a sudden, Moshe, he died. He, he left the world. So therefore, the Torah gave us an allusion to that. And it left out the name of Moshe Rabbeinu. Because just like he disappeared from the Torah all of a sudden, so too he disappeared from this world. That's the Vilna Gaon's observation. And he makes another interesting ob observation. Everything, Chazal tells us that everything that occurs in this world is alluded to in the Torah. As a matter of fact, they once asked the Vilna Gaon, tell me, where are you alluded to in the Torah? So the Vilna Gaon said something very interesting. He said, in the last of the five books of Moses, Sefer Dvarim, there are ten parshas. The Tzavim Vayelech are considered one parsha. He said each one of those ten parshas are parallel to one of the hundred years of the last of the six millennia. We know that, on the, that after 6,000 years from creation of the world, there are going to be tremendous changes in the world. Right now, it's 5,752 years since the creation of the world. That means that we're in the sixth millennia. From the year 5,000 to the year 6,000, that's the sixth of the thousand years. And if you'll take every hundred years and, and apply them to each one of those portions, then it comes out that the Vilna Gaon lived in the portion that will be parallel to Giseitse. In that parsha, there's, there's a word there, Evan Shlema, which means a complete stone. What the Torah is talking about is a person who, person who was in business. Once upon a time, how did they weigh? What type, how, how, how did they weigh objects for sale? They would have, they would have a, a scale, a balance, and they would have set weights. They knew that this weight is a pound weight. This weight is a two pound weight. And they would measure. You're buying, you want to buy flour? You want a pound? So I'll take a, I'll take a, a stone that's one pound, a one pound stone. And I'm going to fill up the other side with flour until they, they equal out. Now if a person is not honest, so then he's going to go and he's going to take a stone that's not a complete stone. It'll be a stone that weighs only uh, a few ounces less than a pound. And then he'll be able to cheat, he'll cheat the, the buyer. The Torah says, no, you have to have a complete stone. An Eben Shlema. So the Vilna Gaon said, that's where I am alluded to. Eben Shlema, Eben, his name was Eliyahu, the Vilna Gaon. His father's name was Shlomo. So Eben is Eliyahu ben Shlomo. He is alluded to in that parasha, which it corresponds to the time in which he lived. There's another very interesting thing. In the next parsha, the next hundred years, the hundred years that correspond between 1839 and 1939, that's the parsha of Kisovo. You know what you find in parsha of Kisovo? That's where we find 98 kolos, 98 different types of curses that are going to befall the Jewish people if they don't act as they should. Terrible things the Torah predicts are going to happen to Jewish people. When it, that parsha corresponds to the years between 1839 and 1939, on Rosh Hashanah of 1939, when did World War II break out? September 1st, 1939. Correct. And who knows the Jewish date? That was the 17th of Elul, 1939, two, year, two weeks before the end of 1939, which ends that 100-year period. In other words, it was predestined that if the Jewish people wouldn't be behaving as they should, then these clawless and all of these terrible things that I mentioned in the Torah would come to fruition. God waited to the last minute. And you know which parsha it was that week? Are you in Zion Elul? It broke out on September 1st. It was a Friday that year. I don't remember. I wasn't born yet. But it was on a Friday. And the next day, they were laying the parashas kisavoy. That was the parasha. And we saw a fulfillment of, 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 uh, of, of, of everything that the Torah predicts. There's another case where the Torah talks about an event that happened on a certain day. 
And it always works out that that event that the Torah talks about occurs in the week in, the week in which the Torah speaks about it. And that's an event that occurs this week. Moshe Rabbeinu's yard site was when? Was on the seventh of Adar. What about Aaron the Kayin? I think that the only yard site mentioned in the whole Torah is the yard site of Aaron Akayin. His yard site is on the first day of the month of Av. When does the month of Av begin? It begins this Friday. And when does the Torah tell it to us? In which parasha? In the parasha we're going to be reading this Shabbos. And every year, it falls out, the first of Av falls out either in the week preceding the parasha or the week that follows the parasha. And many times the events of the parasha could be, the events of the, of the week could be affected by the previous parasha or the coming parasha. The fact that the Torah tells us that Aaron Akoyan died in this month, that also should help us try and understand the significance of this month, the month of Av. So if we want to understand the significance, or look at Nisan, we say, well, let's see, we see the word Ness in Nisan. So Av, we know what Av means, and Av is a father. So the month of Av has something to do with the concept of fatherhood. So what's commonly explained is that what's the role of the father vis-a-vis -vis his children in contrast to the mother? The father ideally is the disciplinarian. And it's in the month of Av in which we find that many, many tragedies have befallen the Jewish people, and God has disciplined us in this month. That's a commonly accepted explanation as to why this month is called Av. It's a month in which this is the worst month of the year, the month in which throughout the history of Jewish people, beginning in the Midbar when the spies came back and they cried on the night of the ninth of Av, and then God said, I'm going to make this a day of, of crying throughout the generations. And subsequently, the first temple was destroyed on that day. And the second temple, and, 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 and the, the, the great city of Beit was destroyed. The Mishnah enumerates five terrible things that occurred on Tisha B'av. And the truth of the matter is, people, students of history know that World War II really was really a continuation of World War I. And World War I began with the assassination of the, I forgot who was the German, uh, it, was, it was a German, uh, what? Ferdinand. Ferdinand, and that event also occurred on, that occurred on Tisha B'Av. That's what set everything into motion. That's what got Germany to start World War I, and World War II was really only a means of uh, trying to get back what they lost in World War I and try to, to retaliate. So Tisha B'Av is a day which is a day uh, in which tragedy before the Jewish people. We're being disciplined. But I want to look at it from a different perspective. In the Hebrew language, there are 22 different letters that are means of, represent different sounds that a person can make when he's speaking. And the different letters are divided into five different groups, each group being determined by the part of the person's mouth that makes those sounds. When a person speaks, so he uses all different types of sounds. For some, he uses his lips. For some, he uses his tongue. For some, some sounds are guttural. I'll give an example. There's one group of letters in the Hebrew language we make a bump, bays, vav, mem, and pay. A bays, b, we'll take the mem, m, p. These are all sounds that are made by the lips. The vav is also considered one of them. The vav is not totally made by the lips. V, you use your teeth with your bottom lip. That's the way we pronounce it. But tamenim, the tame, the, the Yemenite Jews who probably have the really the, 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 the proper way to pronounce the uh, Hebrew language. You know how they pronounce above? W. Not w. And, uh, and the way they pronounce it, then it's also made by the lips. That's why the Ashkenazi Jews, when they have when something bad, I say, oi vei, oi vai. 
by the table and say, why, why, why? It's the, it's, this, this expression of by is written in Hebrew with vav, 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 yud. The question is only how you pronounce that. So the Ashkenazi pronounces vay, oi, vay, oi, vay. And the table says, why, why, why? There's another group of letters. And that's the guttural letters. Letters which represent sounds that are produced by the throat. In that group, you have the aleph, the ches, the hay, the ayin. And maybe the reish also. In America, the reish is not a guttural sound. We say reish like the Israelis do, then it is a guttural sound. But the first four, aleph, ah, ha, ha, ah, those are all guttural sounds. And if uh, two letters come from the same place, then they can be, they can be, then they're interchangeable. So if I have the word av, I can change the aleph for a hey because they're from the same grouping, and I can get the word have. And what does the word have mean? The word have means to give. So I see over here there must be something to do, a connection between the month of Av and giving. Well, first, let's look at the connection between a father and giving. And that's what a father's all about. The father is constantly giving to his children. That's what, it, that, 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 that's what it is. A father, that's a father gives, gives to a child. The fact that a father gives to a child that's a natural thing. It's a natural thing. All fathers give to their children. If a father doesn't, then there's something wrong. That's a natural desire that a person has to give to his children. Why? Because a person's child is really an extension of himself. It's like giving to yourself. When you give to your child, you're not giving something to, 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 to someone else. You're giving to yourself. Because your child is really an extension of yourself. By nature, does a person give to other people? What's the natural, uh, human nature? Is human nature su such that a person naturally gives or he takes? So if we want to look at human nature, and we have to look at the children. There we'll see, before a child is taught, he's taught values, how, what's the natural instinct of a human being? Then we'll look at a child. The way a child behaves, that's the way Every person behaves naturally and instinctively. You see kids, what are they doing all the time? They're fighting. Each one each one's trying to take for himself. You have to try and teach the child to share. That's already a lesson to teach to share, and that's, that's not a simple task. Why? Because naturally, people take. People don't want to give. It's against human nature to give away what one has. What one wants to do instinctively is take more for oneself. One needs a value system in order to get the person to start giving. We know in the Torah there's a mitzvah to give. There's a mitzvah of tzedakah, to give charity. We have to know that in contrast to other religions, there is nothing in the Torah that goes against human nature. In other religions, there are things that go against human nature. It's against human nature for a man not to get married. We know that there are religions in which there are men that, for religious reasons, don't get married. That's what their religion preaches. That ideally a man shouldn't get married. That's the ideal. They're elite. They don't get married. That's against human nature. The Torah, in the Torah, you will never find something that goes against human nature. So how is it that we're expected to give? We just said that human nature is to take and not to give. How is it the Torah requires of us to give? It must be that we also have within us this ability to give. 
But why? If, we, if, if what, what, what we want to do is to take, then why would we want to give? And the answer is simple. The answer is that really all we want to do is take. But there's a form of taking which is accomplished by giving. Giving is taking. That's the answer. Ultimately, all we want to do is take. All we want to do is receive. And that's what we're putting this world for. We're supposed to be taking. But the question is, what are we supposed to be taking? If we're talking about material things, when it comes to material things, then when you take, when you give, then you're not taking, you're losing. I'm giving something away, then I'm losing it. That's from a material perspective, materialistic perspective. But if we we'll look at things on a deeper level, then when you give, you're also taking something. You're getting something in exchange. The Torah gave us a mitzvah, a mitzvah of giving charity to a poor person. Mitzvah not Torah. I'm giving away my money. Am I receiving for something in return? Sure. When a person gives something to a poor person, it feels good. I help someone. It gives me a good feeling. I feel like I'm a good person now. It's rewarding. So even though I'm giving something, but I'm getting something in return. It's any kind of person, whenever a person buys something, how do you buy something? You buy something by giving. But am I giving? I'm giving away my money. <laughs> but I really, I'm not giving, I'm taking. The word for purchasing in Lashon HaKadosh is kicha, means to take. To take something without giving, that's not taking, that's stealing. If you take something without giving, you give something, and that's how you take it. You get it something, something in return, that's how you take. When a person is buying, he's also he's taking something for himself. But how is he taking? He's taking by giving. So if a person is giving charity, He's true, he's giving away some money, but he's exchanging that. He's feeling good about himself. But Chazal tell us that besides the mitzvah of Tzedakah, there's also a mitzvah of Gmilas Chasodim, that means doing kind deeds, one with another. And Gmilas Chasodim, Chazal say, is greater than Tzedakah. Being benevolent, is greater than giving charity. Why? And it, as I'll point out, there, there are a few ways in which it's greater. First of all, charity, you can only give charity to, to a per, poor person. You can't give charity to a rich person, that's not charity. But to be benevolent, to do an act of kindness with, a, with someone else, that can be with anyone. It can be with the wealthiest person in the world. Even just giving a hello to a very wealthy person can be an act of kindness. He may be very wealthy, but he may be very lonely. That could very well be. And you give him, you give him a nice good morning, that's an act of kindness. You're giving. So we see that, what, that we have, there's a mitzvah to give a rich man as well. Now, why should I give the person a nice good morning? According to what we're saying, there's no such thing as giving without receiving. A person, to give without receiving is against human nature. I have to be able to receive something. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be receiving something material. If I go to the store, I give my money, I'm getting something material in, in, in return. Uh, but we pay for things that which are not material as well. People pay, people give money for, to, to experience, people go for entertainment. That's not for something which is uh, uh, an object, but that's also something, something which is real. But a person, a person can be nice to someone else, a person can give of his time, just to give of your own time. I'm gonna, I know there's, there's a person that's lonely, I'm going to give him my precious time. <laughs> maybe it's an, an elderly person, maybe someone who's, who's, who's bedridden, a mitzvah of bigger chaylem, to visit the sick. What do you mean, my, the time? Time is very precious. It could be at the time as money I'm taking off my job, or even with my free time. I'm taking off of my time. I'm giving of my time. But there as well, 
I'm getting something in return. What am I getting in return? I'm connecting with the other person. And that's also something which, is, which, which a human being finds rewarding. A person wants to be connected with other people. So we're saying that what, of course, human nature is such to take. But there are different ways of taking. And one way of taking is by giving. And that's, the, that, that, that's, the, that's the loftier type of, 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 of taking. Have, we said, means to give. When there's a relationship of love between two people, what brings about that relationship? So people assume that when you receive something from someone, then that makes me love them. By receiving, you love. Rav Dessler points out that the true love doesn't come as a result of receiving. You don't love someone really because you got from them, but only when you give to them. And if you look at the word for love in Lashon HaKadosh, Ahava, then the two middle letters spell out have, to give. And he demonstrates it with, 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 with a, an incident that he witnessed. He said there was a young couple before World War I that had one child. And they were, this child was the apple of the eye. They, they lived for the child. And as a result of the war, the parents got split up, as happened during war. And the child ended up with the father. And they spent three or four years together, the father and the son, until they were able to be reunited when the war ended. He said, we know usually the connection that exists between a mother and a child, the bond is usually much greater than the bond between a father and a child. And in this case, it was the other way around. The bond that existed between the father and the, and, and, and the son was greater than that was between the mother and the son. Something which is, which is not natural. He said, why? Because who was taking care of the child? Who invested energy into that child for those three or four years? It was the father. Because the father took care of the child and put all of his energy into the child and the mother didn't, therefore the bond between them was greater than the bond between the mother. The mother kept on wanting to see this boy who already became a grown boy. She, want, she wanted back her baby. Because that's how she related to him. She put her energy into the child when he was a, when he was a baby. That was, her connection was with her son as a baby. Now already he was already, he was grown, and there was a gap, and she was never able to compensate for, 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 for that gap. Aaron Akain, he, he leaves this world on the first of Av. And Aaron Akon also, he had this, he had this, uh, this, this trait of personality. He was able to take as a means of, uh, by means of giving. Aaron Akon was Moshe Rabbeinu's older brother. When God told Moshe Rabbeinu that he wants him to be the redeemer of the Jewish people, he was in Midian at the time, Moshe Rabbeinu. He had to escape. You know, he was hiding. And, Moshe Rabbeinu saw the burning bush, and God appears to him and tells him, now it's time for you to go back to Egypt and take out the Jewish people. And Moshe Rabbeinu was very reluctant to do so. Why? He said, what do you mean? I have an older brother. How's my older brother going to feel if I, the younger brother, are going to become the leader and the king of the Jewish people? How's he going to feel? So what does God tell them? Don't worry. Aaron Akon is going to be very happy for you. When he comes to meet you, he's going to be overjoyed over the fact that you are the one that were chosen. And that's indeed what happened. By human nature, Aaron Akon should have felt very slighted, very uncomfortable. What do you mean? My younger brother, my, my little brother, he's becoming the, he's becoming the, 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 the king and the leader? And why was I surprised? that he was a great man, Aaron Akayim. He was giving up something over there. No, uh, he overlooked it. Not only did he overlook it, he was, he was happy for him. But he received something. You know what he received? His giving, his sacrifice. He didn't, get, he didn't lose by giving up his, his claim to the, to, to, to the leadership of the Jewish people. You know what he got for it? 
Chazal said he got the Urim the Tumim, he became the Kayan Godl. And that's maybe the connection between Aaron Akayim's dying on the first day of the month of Av, because that's the message of Av. The message of Av, which we're saying really the same Av, is that giving is really receiving. And that's the ultimate, that's the ideal way of receiving of taking. We all want to take. The question is how? How do we want to take? Chazal telling us, you know how we should be taking? We should be taking by, by, by giving. And we find this in the mitzvah of Tzedakah. There's something very interesting. When the Torah commands the Jewish people to contribute towards the building of the Mishkan. So each individual is required to give a half a shekel, the machzis a shekel. And the word the Torah used is vinosnu. They shall give. And the Baal Aturim points out there's something very interesting about the word Vinosnu. You can read it in both directions the same way. You start, Vinosnu, Vav, Nun, Tav, Nun, Vav. In English it's called the Palandarum. A word that you can read both directions the same way. Abba is the same thing. You read it backwards, Ima is the same thing. Why is it that Vinosnu is written like that? So the Baal Aturim says, He says, Whatever a person gives away to Tzedakah, he's going to get back. That's why it's Venosnu. Venosnu, you give out like that, you read it backwards, it comes back to you. Because that's, and that was talking about for the, for the, for the, for the building of the Mikdash. That's the concept of Tzedakah. You're giving, we're saying that when a person gives Tzedakah, so what does he get back? He gets back a good feeling. He helped the, helped the person. Here it says more than not only going to get back, but you're going to get back even the material what you gave, even the money that you gave the stalker, is going to come back to you. And the Vilna Goyen points out that in the very next Pasuk, it says over there, regarding this Machtus HaShekel, which was used towards the construction of the Mishkan, Ha'oshir lo yarbe v'hadal lo yamit. A rich man can't give more, and a poor man can't give less. Everyone has to give equally. We know that when we read the Torah, there's a certain tune to which we read it. There's a trop, it's called in Yiddish, cantillations. If you look in the Chumash, there are different signs that tell you how to read, how, which melody to apply to each word. There are different melodies that apply to each word. And those cantillations have names. If you look at the names of, the, of those cantillations under the words Osher La Yarbe, it's a Munach Revi. That's the name of those, of, 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 of those cantillations. The Vilna Gun says that over here, the Torah uh, hinted to us a halacha that it says in the Gemara. The Gemara says there's a mitzvah of tzedakah, and a person should give tzedakah. Let's say a person is very wealthy. He has hundreds of millions of dollars. How much should he give? The Gemara says, until one-fifth, not more, 20%, the maximum, even if you could afford to give more. Maybe in certain cases, exceptions. But as a rule, there was a rule. You can't give away more than 20%, one-fifth. In other words, four-fifths keep for yourself, the one-fifth you give away, not more than that. So the Vilna Gaon says that here the Torah alluded to us, the four parts keep for yourself. The fifth, that's what you give for tzedakah, that's what you give away. And it could be Av, Av is the fifth month, the fifth month of the year. I was saying that that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the significance of Av. It's this union of giving, giving away, which ultimately is a means of receiving. And this is how the Beis HaMikdash was built. The Beis HaMikdash had to be built specifically by the contribution of every single Jew. The rich one can't give more, the poor one can't give less, collectively. We all have to give, and as a result of that giving, ultimately, we're taking. Because even in a material sense, the fact that the Beis HaMikdush existed brought tremendous bracha, not only to the Jewish people, but to the entire world. There was a tremendous amount of affluence 
there was a tremendous amount of blessing and bracha that existed in the world when the Beis HaMikdash existed. The rabbis tell us that had the Goyim knew how much they benefited from the Beis HaMikdash, then they would have sent their armies to protect the Beis HaMikdash instead of destroying it. They were de harming themselves because the Beis HaMikdash is a source, is a source of blessing. And the fact, this concept, that giving is really taking, we find in Pasha's Truma when we, Torah talks about the construction of the Mishkan, which is the forerunner of the Beis HaMikdash. There's a very interesting lotion over there. The Torah says, the Torah requires each person to make a contribution to the Mikdash, to the Mishkan, it says, the Yikhuli Truma. The Jewish people should take a donation. What do you mean? They should take, they should give a donation. And the answer is that when you're giving, you're really taking. And that's what the, that, that, that's what the Torah is telling us. And that's what the Beis HaMikdash is all about. Beis HaMikdash brought together the Jewish people. Jewish people gave towards the Beis HaMikdash, but they received everything back, I don't know how, how many fold. We know why did we lose the Beis HaMikdash. We lost the Beis HaMikdash, the second Beis HaMikdash, the second temple, because there was Sinas Chinam. There was Lashon Hara. People spoke bad again, one against the other. There was, a, there, was a, there, was this, there was this parody. There was a lack of unity. Why? What, what does that mean? That means that people were selfish. Everyone was interested in doing one thing, in taking for themselves. That's the the way a child takes. We're all expected to take. That's what it's all about. That's what we are put in this world for. The Gemara says that this world is like, is like, a, like, like a wedding. And like a wedding, you try and grab as much as you can. So too, that's what we're meant to do in this world. Grab. But don't grab at the expense of someone else. Don't grab material things. Grab things that you can take with you. Grab things that what that they're going to remain yours. Torah mitzvahs. Those are things that what the, the anything a person does that you can't take away. You, 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 even a favor you did to someone else. You connect with that other person. You develop the relationship with the other person. That you can't take away. If you grab someone, uh, someone else's uh, belongings, so then someone will grab it from you. You grab it from him. In a society where everyone's selfish, everyone's interested in, in themselves, not thinking about the other person, everyone's taking, in the end, then no one has. I take from you and you take from me, then no one has. But if everyone's giving, then everyone has. I'm going to conclude. There's a pasuk in, Kah in Kahelis. The pasuk says like this: "Shalach lach mecha al pnei amoyim ki b'roiv hayomim timtzeenu." I'll read to you the translation, the English translation. The translation is as follows: "Send your bread upon the waters." For after many days you will find it. What does that mean? Throw out your bread on the water, and eventually it's going to come back to you. So Rashi explains. And Rashi says that this is, this is what's meant. Rashi says, do a good deed, a benevolent act to a person that your heart's going to tell you you're never going to see him again. Do, some, do an act of kindness to someone that you think you're never going to see again. In other words, in a way where you don't expect to ever receive anything in return. And you know what's going to happen? Just like a person throws out, his, you throw out bread into the water of the ocean, you don't expect ever to see it again. You know what's going to happen? Days are going to come, and you're going to see that you're going to get paid back for it. The favor is going to come back to you. It may take many days, but the favor is going to come back to you. And Rashi demonstrates it, probably Bichazal, with that which the Torah tells us about Yisrael. Yisrael had seven daughters. When Moshe Rabbeinu escaped, he escaped from Paro, so he came to Midian. He was all alone, and he met the daughters by a well, and he helped out the daughters, and they came back and they told the father, I told Yisrael what happened. And Yisrael said, one second, why would you leave him over there? Why don't you bring him to, to, to have a meal? So they went back, and they invited him for a meal. 
Yisrael knew he would never ever see this person again. He was an Egyptian man. He was in Midian. He must have been passing through. So what? I'll give him a meal. What happened? This man married one of his daughters. He used to have seven daughters. That alone was a, <laughs> a great thing. He married up one of his daughters. But not only that, as a, as a means of marrying up his daughter to Moshe Rabbeinu, years later, Yisra became a convert. And Yisra's, Yisra's grandchildren, they sat in the Lishka Agos, that means they became from the greatest scholars of the Jewish people. All as a result of Yisra, he did a favor he did a favor for someone that he never expected to see again. Eventually, even in a, in a, in a, in a, in a real materialistic sense, it's going to come back to you. It might take time, but it's going to come back to you. The, 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 the favor he did for someone else is going to come back to you. It was just an incident in our community this past Friday. <laughs> the possibly it sounds like it might, that it's going to take a long time for you to get that favor come back to you. My daughter's running a day camp now in the summer. She has a friend that's staying with us. She's running it together. This friend, her family's in the mountains. And she wanted to go spend Shabbos with her family. So I needed to get her a ride to the mountains. I had one person here that I knew was going to the mountains. And his van, the back seat wasn't, wasn't set up. His front seats were full. And he was trying to was trying, to, trying to, to, to set it up, and it wasn't going. It was getting late, but he spent a lot of time putting that, uh, putting that seat in his proper place in order to be able to give this girl a ride. He gave the girl a ride. When he comes up to the, to the mountains, he meets his son in his bungalow colony, who was brought to the bungalow colony by the father of this girl. The father of this girl had gone to pick up his daughter from the bungalow colony. The son of the person from over here happened to have been waiting for, for, some, for his father to pick him up on the exit. His father hadn't come yet. He didn't, he didn't know who he was. He didn't know who this boy was. The girl's father picked up this boy, and he went and brought the boy back to, his, to the bungalow colony. The father was thought he was doing a favor, and he wasn't doing a favor to the girl. In the end, he was also doing himself a favor because his son got a ride back to the bungalow colony. So I saw now when it says in the post to keep a rave by Yomim, it doesn't mean that it's going to necessarily take many days. It means eventually it'll surely come back. Sometimes it comes back right away. That's the month, the message of this month. The message of this month of Av is the proper way in which to take. We had to take. But the way to really take is by giving. Thank you. Well, I was so, I was Solomon, thank you so, so much. Rabbi Solomon, thank you so, so much. I, I think I... You're aware we do have a question and answer period. Yes, yeah, yeah, I forgot. Yes, and, yes. and the questions do go on any subject, so. Okay, we'll try. Can't really promise you, we'll try. Don't. Uh, and uh, I just want to say, I, when I was a kid, they, they have a saying in English to give is to truly receive, right? When I was a kid, I thought that, you know, you become a big shot, you know. <laughs> but that's Rabbi Solomon taught us uh, a little d deeper what we get out of it. Rabbi Solomon, uh, yes. I have a question. With regards to Vilna Ga Ga Gaon's prediction, as far as reading the Sefer Dvarim, the Book of Dvarim, so 1939 was this Tohoho, so to speak, uh, like Kisavo or Kisetsi, I'm not sure what is it called, but it was more like admonition. What is this for us in this millennia? And what's in the next millennia, according to this? According book? to this, you know what's in this millennia? Yeah. This millennia is the Tzav Vayelach, which is the Pasha of Tshuva. And here we see, all of a sudden, after thousands of years, the great Tshuva movement. That was in this millennia. Now what about next millennia? And that next millennia is Hazinu. By then, Mashiach will be uh, not, 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 It's by the next hundred years. But Hazinu, Shiru, that's what in Mashiach, that means by the year 2039 in Eretz Hashem, another 27 years, by then Mashiach will be here. And by the year before, hopefully. But by then... <coughs> okay, we'll wait. I'm going to quote you on that. <laughs> How many years did you say? 27? OK. It'll be before that, Mr. Hashem. But that's my 27 for sure. That's another 27 years. I think after the Six Day War started the Baal Tshuva movement, right? After that's the, right. That's that, basically what it started. That that's miraculous. Right. That's right. That's right. That's that's right. That started that's the wave right. that's of, right. of that's right. Jews that's coming that's back. That's right. That's right. Sam, please. Uh, Rabbi, I was uh, waiting for you to use the term 
respect and what you, you mentioned, you give. I'm sure somewhere is respect. When you, when you mention love, does respect come in there somewhere? And sure, but when you, you respect is also a form of giving. Giving respect, you give respect, of course. And, when you, and, and that's what Chazal tell us. Who is the person that's respected? Someone that gives someone else respect. That's how you get back respect. That's, but it doesn't necessarily mean the other person is going to go, you stand up for him or he's going to stand up for you. Just by being, respecting other people, that makes you a respected person. That's what Chazal say in others. I just wanted that included, please. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Ernie, please. But very, it's a very good uh, addition. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi, you mentioned at the beginning of your Devar Torah about how well the Torah can forecast and predict events to come, namely September 1st, 1939, the invasion of uh, Poland, Russia. Uh, to me, to explain this by saying, well, the Jews sinned, therefore they were punished. To me, that's a cop-out. You cannot explain away children and infants and women and innocent people, who are good people, to be wiped out in the storm that God wiped out everything. I think it's better to leave it alone rather than to explain it. Well, I'm going to leave, it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. Ernie Salomon's a guest. Ernie he's a humble guest. I'm a more of an old timer here, Ernie. What should we say if the Torah tells us certain reasons that cause such tragedies? Are we going to ignore what the Torah tells us? We can't be an ostrich, we're gonna put our heads. The Torah gives us insights what causes these tragedies. That's a different, that's a different question. Oh, that's a different question. But uh, you sound like we should skirt the whole issue and not even, the Torah tells us. The Gemara tells us that the greatest tzaddikim are taken away as a result of the sins of the generation. They don't deserve it personally, but there's, sacrifices that the Jewish people as, a, as an entirety are bringing. It's not because they themselves deserve it. But sometimes we have this concept that because they're such great people, then they're the sacrifices that atone for the entire Jewish people. They don't deserve it personally. It's to the contrary. But because they're so great, so then they are able to represent the entire Jewish people and their children. Rabbi Salomon, doesn't the Torah also say that sometimes little children yes, I was definitely, and the sins of the parents yes, are because I was, they're like... I was, uh, yes, yes, yes. That's because right. the children are extensions of the parents. So That's right. They're, they're on. There are many things that we don't understand when we see things in a very limited scope. But if we would... Sometimes we have a concept of Gilgul. Many times people are not here in this world for the first time. And we don't know history. The Chavetz Chaim once said that if we would know if we would be able to go back a few hundred years in the histories of our parents, grandparents, etc., there are many different events that we don't understand because we don't know history, would all of a sudden fall into place and we'd begin to understand. We have a very limited uh, uh, view of, of, of what's going on. Things, when they're taken in the context of, of, of past and history, so uh, they, they, they assume a whole, a whole new different, uh, uh, new different uh, perspective. So, we as human beings, that's, that's part of, uh, that's part of our, our task, to, to have faith in God and believe that whatever God has done is, does is righteous, is, is, is the, the right thing, even though we, at this point, don't understand it. That's the Muslim quote, whatever God does is for the good. That's why Tisha B'Av eventually, from all the terrible tragedies that, that occur in Tisha B'Av, that's going to bring about the redemption. I just want to make two comments. Um. I've heard a very interesting explanation, like uh, how to understand that the tzaddikim being, being taken away. Uh, in electronics, uh, especially in the olden times, there used to be a concept of a fuse, so to speak. So if there is a high voltage electricity comes, it's not that the whole refrigerator fails, so to speak. It's the fuse that's being knocked out. So the Jewish people have like greatest leaders, uh, greatest scholars, they're like the fuses. They go first. 
So when God needs to punish like a generation, so to speak, or something, then the fuses are being taken out first. That obviously doesn't explain the Holocaust, but that a little bit explains the concept of uh, taking away leaders that atone for our sins, so to speak. The second comment that I wanted to make that personally shocked me, if you read the book of Devarim at the very end, um, right before they enter the land of Israel, there is a series of blessings and there is a series of curses. And, and basically, the whole nation stood in front of Eretz Yisrael right before they entered, and they said, okay, if we're going to do those things, you're going to be blessed, and there is a series of blessings, and everybody said, Amen. And then, if you're going to do bad things, uh, the nation should be cursed, and everybody said, Amen. In a way, it basically was like perpetual or like communal binding that took place, and everybody accepted it. So in a way, we're like in, in one big pot, so to speak. And if the nation overall does well, we are getting the blessing overall as a nation. If the nation overall sins, so to speak, and again, it's difficult to explain what it means, we are all together on it because we are together, said domain, at that point in time, right before entering the land of Israel. So that, in a way, shocks me. That also explains why... I could be responsible or I could be punished for somebody else like uh, doing something else as a Jew because we are in the same path, so to speak. So I just wanted to add my 20 cents. Excellent. We all are responsible one for the other. We're all on all the same path. Exactly. Excellent. And Ernie, as a military man, one soldier doesn't, he can't say, I'm not following orders, you know, I'm mind, mind your business, you know. But you can de jeopardize. No, but one soldier can, can, can get a whole unit in, in, a, in a dangerous situation if he doesn't carry out his orders. So one guy, you know, people in a boat, the old example, one guy says drilling a hole to the boat, and the other, they're like, what are you doing? Mind your business. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting my under cabin. my seat. Right? My cabin. You know, we're all going to go under. You drill a hole under your seat, we're all going, we're all sinking. So the kind of, it's hard, Ernie, it is hard to verbalize the actual details, but... General concept, I think that was a beautiful example that Ola gave us. Uh, Dude, excellent, excellent, beautiful. beautiful. I never heard of it. excellent. Your sure. Any questions on any other subject? This subject, any other subject? Louis? Louis? Well, same thing. Uh, if you could sort of explain, I'll, I'll give you three synapses, and then you, because you, you brought up a very interesting point. But you throw, you, you take your breadcrumbs, you throw it into the sea or, you, or into the creek or into a river or... They, they have, I'm just going to say what things have been said and obviously some may be wrong or whatever. You, you're the master, so you, you tell me. You go on Passover perhaps and you take your, you, you, take, you take bread and you go on Passover and you find a river or whatever, water or whatever, and you throw the bread in there, you're throwing away your chomets. You go on Rosh Hashanah, or you go on Yom Kippur, and you're taking the bread, and you're, and you're, and you're throwing bread into the stream, and you're doing brachas, you know, and whatever. And that represents you're throwing away your sins for that year, or for, you know, you know whether Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, you're throwing away your sins by meaning by throwing away that. And now you bring an interesting point, is when you're taking some bread, and you're th throwing it into the, see, so you're actually taking something that may have... A, a, whether you want to call it value or symbolic or whatever, and you're put, throwing it in there as, as a good deed, and it's going to come back to you. So th there's three different relationships here. Uh, wh which ones are true? Are they all true? Or They're probably it, all true. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, is it, just, tra is it just, just tradition? I know once in a while, they, they, even the yeshiva goes there once, you know, I see down, I don't know the yeah, full yeah, story yeah. on which, but. Even though we don't throw the bread in, but there is such a custom. When I was a child, we did it. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. There is maybe such not, a custom. Maybe they, I know they stand there there is a custom. We, want, we, this, we say the prayers, but there is a custom to throw bread. The main thing are the prayers, though, not the... Uh, but, but what's the bread? The, what does the bread is symbolic. You know, some, sometimes it's symbolic of throwing our sins. If, if, if you don't... If, is it true or it's just... Yeah, no, no, yeah. no the, 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 if, you, if you don't repent, then it doesn't work. Okay, because sometimes they just like you may just say brach the water as a stream well, without the bread or whatever. We're not saying what we're doing over there is that we're saying that we want to get we want to rid ourselves. But if a person doesn't really make up his mind to rid himself, yeah. then throwing the bread is, is meaningless. Okay, those three things are have, have some 
truth to them? The three different things, or just one of them, or two of them, or? They will have some truth to them. Oh, I know. And you said something about a half a shekel. How much is a half a shekel worth now? Um, today, maybe $12. $12, oh. $13. And silver, the amount of silver, the coin, the weight of silver, the price of silver today, I think it's about $12, $13. Oh, and they say so when you give charity, you should give uh, half a shekel? Or? No, no, that was for the Mishkan. Now, what, 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 what's the Mishkan? The Mishkan, for, for the, for, to make the, that was to erect the tabernacle in the, in the desert. That was, the, each oh. person had to give that. Oh, okay. Thank you. We're accustomed in America, you know, you go to the water, you expect to find a genie in a bottle, give you any wish you want. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way, John. <laughs> I have a question. What do we do with a very, a very serious, everyone, so many people have this problem. We put our heart and soul into our children, and sometimes we don't get the respect from the children. We feel we put in everything, and, and we get disrespect. Does that mean we did something wrong, Rabbi Solomon? What? Hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara's here to back you up. If you, any, any, she gets this question all the time, I'm sure. As a well, we get, again, you see, what? <laughs> what we get back, what we definitely get back, is our connection to the child. The, the, the fact that we're connected to the child, that's what we get back. We don't, that, what you're talking about already is a materialistic oh, benefit oh, of respect. Oh, that's, that's right. That's, I overlooked that. Right. We're expecting well, a return. That's that, correct. Right? Yes. What we get back is, the, is our connection to the child. And really, this is demonstrated. I, I forgot to say it in the, in, the, in the course of my talk. There's an interesting halacha. The halacha bobe machteris. What happens? To, this is the principle of self defense. What happens if a person, God forbid, in the middle of the night, someone's breaking into his house. Is he allowed to go and take a gun and shoot that person? Someone's breaking into your house. You have a gun in the house. Are you allowed? I, I, don't, I, I don't know what the second law is. I'm not, uh, I don't want to take the court after this. <laughs> According to Jewish law, someone's breaking into your house. I have a gun. If I want, I could shoot him. The Torah says, yes, you're allowed to shoot the person and to kill the person, and you're not, and you're not, you're not a murderer. Why? Because it's self-defense. Because you have to assume that if the person is breaking into a house, then what's the natural reaction of the person, the, the, of, the, of, the, of the person in the house going to be? He's going to try to protect his property and try to, and try to, uh, and try to kill, try to kill the, the, the intruder. That means that the intruder has in mind to fight back and kill you. The someone who's breaking into your house ultimately has in mind to kill you if he has to. Since he's coming to kill you, then someone is trying to kill you, then you're allowed to go and kill him before he kills you. That's the halacha in every case except for one exception. Except if it's a father breaking into his son's house. If a father breaks into his son's house, the son is not allowed to kill the father. Why? Because he can be sure that his father is not going to kill him. A father will never kill the son. But what if it's the opposite? What if it's the son that's breaking into the father's house? Then the father is allowed to kill the son? Because it could be the son would kill the father. That means that a father would never kill a son. But it's possible that a son would kill a father. And unfortunately, in the, in the newspaper, they see both ways, unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> but a, a father would not kill his own child. A child is capable of doing that. Here we see what, that the bond that's created by giving, the father's giving to the child. I, the father can't do that to the son. The son's been receiving all the time. My, my, he, he's still capable of doing it. The fact that the son is not giving back respect, that's, unfortunately, that's the, many times the case today. There's no guarantee you're going to get back that respect. Probably eventually you will. Eventually. For the, material, for the material return, that takes time. But the immediate return is the connection that the father has created with the son. And now I have a son. And the nachas that a person has from having a son, that, that, that connection, that's what he's getting back. And that can't be taken away from him. I forgot that crucial point. You cannot give in, with, 
intention to get back. Right. Give. You're giving, but giving yourself is right. there's, there's a return. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Solomon. Last call for any questions? Thank you, Rabbi Solomon.